Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm going to give it a minute or two before we get started. In the meantime, feel free to drop your name and organization in the chat so we know who's joining us today. All right, so it looks like the attendees have come to a standstill, so we'll go ahead and get started. Continue to drop your name and organization in the chat. Welcome to NPIN Social Media Writing and Editing webinar. So our webinar today will be led by Aileen Comey and Victoria Atonda. So now I will hand it over to Aileen to get us started. Hello, everyone. Um, I am sorry to turn my camera off. I'm too worried I'm going to freeze at the most unattractive stage. So to <laughs> save you all from that. Um, so great to chat with you all today, just to run you through the table of contents, everything that myself and Victoria will be going through, um, the elements of a social media post, audience matters, and creative writing styles to run you through basically what it is for the rundown of social media. So keep going through, starting with main thing. What is kind of crazy nowadays, really people are just always on their phone, really, or even just on their computer, everyone is scrolling through their phone so quickly, 1.7 seconds. That's really how long it takes for someone to look at a post and move on. It's just speedy scrolls, really speedy kind of paying attention. So what is it that we need to do to get people to pay attention to what we are doing, to get people to pay attention to what information we are putting out there? So what is, if you would go to the next slide, the elements of a strong social media post that we can put together? There are three main elements, a hook, a call to action, and a hashtag. So to dive a bit deeper into all of them, the first one being a hook. A hook is basically a clever and compelling line that can grab attention. What can get a thumb to stop scrolling, whether it's a question, a wordplay, a clever statement, et cetera, something that can get a person to stop what they're doing and say, okay, this is a post I'm actually interested in. We added some examples on here from the National Park Service, whether it's, we all have that one friend who needs to learn how to whisper. When someone asks you what's wrong, but nothing's wrong, that's just how your face look, whether it's something cute and funny or whether it's something that really kind of wows you and bams you and really gets your attention, it's a hook. So we have a few activities for you in this. And the first one is we wrote this tweet below um, to promote our resource about perinatal hepatitis testing, but we didn't include a hook for you. So we would love it if you would write three hooks that could help get readers engaged. What would get them to stop for this Twitter post? So if you could drop three ideas that you have in the chat, no answer is wrong. 
but what could get someone or what would get you to stop with this tweet? And Zykeia will read some of the ones out loud that she sees. I'll give you a bit of time to do this. Okay, so we have one in the chat. Do you know the new guidelines for perinatal hep C testing? That's a good one. That's great because someone who doesn't know would say, no, I don't, you know, like gets them to stop and say, all right, let me find them out. Sorry to interrupt you. No worries. Do we have any more ideas this is a practice ground oh we have another one pregnant well pregnant question mark you need to know this yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh we have another one did you know this and then the next one expecting question mark you need to know this and our next one is h hashtag hcps New perinatal hep C testing just released. I like that you need to know this because that will grab people saying, well, what is it that I need to know? What is the grab that is the must to know here? Oops, I'll do two more. Expecting a baby? Ask your doctor about perinatal hep C testing to protect your baby's health. And another one? No more babies born with hep, hashtag hep C. There's a lot of really good answers in here. All right, so I'll continue responding to everyone in the chat. And Aileen, would you like to continue moving forward? Yes, please. Great, thanks guys. All right, next one to tackle is call to actions or CTAs, um, which basically are ways to compel your audience and way to get, ways to get them to act and go a direction that you want them to go with your social media posts. So just fun facts to share, CTAs can help increase conversion rates, the rates of users that take the action you want them to take, such as clicking on a link by 100 and 21%, which is crazy to think about. Also, adding a CTA to a Facebook page can increase a click-through rate or the rate of a user who click on that specific link to the number of total users who view that by over 200%, almost 300%. It's, it's crazy how much two words adding that to a post can do. Examples on the other side, read more, learn more, find out more, even three words can add that much to a post to get them through to your page to find out the information you want them to find out or to get them to sign up for something, to get them to take that next action that you want them to do. So just think back, what CTAs have you used that have helped to up that engagement that you were looking for? If there's been any in the past that you've used, have they helped make that next step? CTAs really help push to get your audience to do what you want, to reach that goal that you're looking for. But there is one thing you need to know for CTAs, which leads us to link in bios because Instagram loves being Instagram and being tricky. You cannot use URLs with um, posts on Instagram, you have to put your URL in a bio, thus the link in bio, um, unless it is an ad or anything you pay like that, the sign up now that you see when you're scrolling. Um, so we put some examples here so you can see the click in, click the link in bio to get yours. Is there anything we can do about it? Read the full argument and possible solutions at the link in bio. You can use 
an emoji link or anything like that to try to get people to scroll up, go to that link, find the other way to get through. Um, Instagram just makes a little bit different CTA. You click the link in bio rather than actually putting the link there. So one thing to keep in mind when doing a CTA. So that brings us to our next activity. Since we can't do the URL in the copy, we wrote an event on an Instagram post, but we need to direct readers to that link. So how would you direct leaders to the link for this post? Write your own call to action and share it in the chat. It's a Wednesday, get nice and creative. And no need to write three, four, et cetera. You can write one or two. All right, we've got one ready to take part, question mark. Register using the link in our bio. And then a little pointing emoji. Great. Next one, we have limited registration and then insert link or URL. Find out what's new in hashtag HIV prevention, RSVP via link in bio, hashtag stop HIV together. Love the use of the hashtags. That's great. Let's see, take action to protect your baby's health. Click, click the link in our bio to learn more. And I'll go on to the next two. Read about prevention updates in our bio. And the next one, reserve your spot, question mark, link in bio. Direct to the point, great. All right. Another fun activity about links. We want to ensure that the audience clicks the link. So which of these call to action options do you think is the most engaging for that post that we have below? So it looks like we're getting a lot of Bs for this response. Aileen, want to give them the answer? Okay. While well, all work, we think C would actually be a great answer. A and B are great um, CTAs, but C fits more of the tone of the post a bit more. It's more of a family post, et cetera, family friendly. Check out fits more of the tone, whereas learn more, read this is a bit more, not as, I can't think of the word <laughs> that would work <laughs> with it, but um, thank you. Formal is the perfect way to say it. Approachable. See? Perfect. So go in with C. All right. Next big topic is hashtags. So hashtags are quite popular due to the fact that they can really help enhance the meeting, meaning and discover, discoverability of the content. Everybody knows hashtags can really grab the attention 
We put the main types of hashtags, it's location, whether it's daily hashtags, relevant phrase, acronyms, emojis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Hashtags really just make it easier to discover the post around specific topics. You can aggregate all social media content with the same hashtag. Hashtags can either be organically incorporated into sentences or included at the end of sentences. And then for structure, it's ideal to keep hashtags, if it's one word, lowercase, if a hashtag is multiple words, two words, et cetera, capitalize the first word, first letter of each word. There's a lot of different kind of ways you can approach hashtags. It depends on your audience, who you're reaching out to, et cetera. Um, but hashtags are all over, lots of different ways you can approach them. So fun facts about hashtag, tweets with hashtags receive two times the amount of engagement than tweets without hashtags, which is a little insane. And there's 29% more engagement on a post that'll include at least one hashtag. And LinkedIn users that use hashtags can see 38% increase in impressions. So how to find the best hashtags to use in your post. Main four things, create a branded hashtag. Have people be able to associate a hashtag with your campaign. Use it through multiple posts. Have people, people be able to see a hashtag and recognize it with you. Use an Instagram-related hashtag feature. Instagram will offer you hashtags that you can use. Once you pick one, they'll give you other options that you can tackle and add on. Instagram can be really helpful. Research what hashtags your audience uses on a regular basis. What's popular? What's going on now? What are people using? Research which hashtag your com competition is using. What's working for them? What's not working for them? Do a little research. Just because they're using it doesn't mean you should. Check to see how it's doing. That can be very helpful. And then an example, of course, is Nike's You Can't Stop Us. Just to look at You Can't Stop Us, people will recognize that, okay, that's Nike's. It doesn't even have Nike in it, but people will recognize it with them. And just two fun examples using that one. So for different platforms, it makes sense to use different number of hashtags. For Twitter, two to three hashtags can be used either within a sentence, at the end of the sentence. You don't want to use too many. Facebook, no need to use the hashtag unless they're really part of the campaign you've already established. Instagram, go crazy, go wild, have fun. Hashtags are all over Instagram. And then with LinkedIn, use no more than about five or so hashtags. Then you can go to the next one. Next activity with each of these platforms, which hashtags would you use? Either hashtags that are already in these posts or hashtags you would add to the end of the posts, et cetera. Feel free to drop them in the chat. Our first answer is hashtag CDC NPIN, hashtag CDC, and then hashtag TB prevention. All good ones, Mackenzie. Great ones. In fact, the ones I already had written down, so you stole my answers. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, 
Would anyone add any hashtags to the posts already in there? I think NPIN could become a hashtag. Yep. Yep, so we have hashtag NPIN, mm -hmm. hashtag prevention, hashtag resources and materials, and hashtag CDC again. We have hashtag TB, hashtag HIV. Okay, you guys are getting real descriptive. Hashtag tuberculosis, <laughs> hashtag CDC TB. I love it. Do we These have any okay. other hashtag ideas? These are great. All right, okay. continue to drop your ideas in the chat as we go ahead, guys. Okay, audience matters. Know your audience. Know who you're reaching out to. Know who's reading your stuff. So writing for your audience, main questions to ask. Will my audience understand the references in the copy, in everything that you're writing? What will my audience find interesting? How will my audience perceive what I'm writing? Are emojis worth it? Will my audience like emojis? Just because it's social media doesn't mean you have to put an emo emoji in it. If your audience isn't going to like it, then they might just, if you put an emoji and it's not something for your audience, then they'll stop looking at your tweets. So you want to really understand who you're targeting here. And do I need to add more context to this post? Are you putting enough details in there that they'll understand it? Or is your CTA going to be for more information, here's where you can get it? Because yes, for Twitter, there is a limit on how much you can add in. So what do you need to choose to put on social? What do you need to say to your audience? This is where you can find out more, et cetera. So you really need to know who you're targeting with your social content. All right, it looks like we have arrived to um, my section. And so now everyone, we are gonna be talking about creating a writing style in social media. So we've talked about the structure of the copy that you're writing. We've talked about hashtags, emojis. We've talked about audience. And all of these are very important aspects of writing for social media. But now we're gonna talk a little bit about the writing style and more on the editorial side of things, just realizing what um, should and shouldn't be there at the time that you are posting. All right, and the, this is going to be divided in three sections, mastering the art of brevity, applying storytelling, and playing to a platform strengths. So let's hit it. All right, so mastering the art of brevity. As you remember, when Aileen started showing us some of the, the aspects of writing for social media, she mentioned that there's 1.7 seconds in that time when the post reaches your audience and the time that they swipe away. So how are we gonna grab them? How are we gonna capture their attention and keep them in our socials? So you need to master the art of brevity. So you need to complement um, your headline by covering by conveying just one or two key points. You can also pull an interesting quote, share digestible leads, use relevant emojis. There's different ways that you can utilize that space to your advantage. But the most important thing that I always tell everyone is, depending on the type of post that you're doing, try to not bury the lead. Try to keep it, keep the reason why your readers should engage at the forefront of your post. And this especially applies with platforms like Instagram releasing new um, forms of content like short form videos and reels. You only get around 30 to 35 characters there. And you can see the list of um, su suggested length for posts depending on on platform. Um, but for example, when it comes to short form video, you only get 30 to 35 characters to capture someone's attention in the caption. If you don't do it, then they are just going to watch the video and, and move, move on to the next video. So that means that, that you lose the opportunity to send someone to your website, to the link, to the sign up page. So you definitely want to keep that when, in mind when you are writing. All right, so let's go on to the next one. All right, so we're gonna utilize some of the examples here from the list that we mentioned before. 
So how can you complement the headline with your caption? So the headline for this um, particular article of the Atlantic is hospitals can go on like this. And the way that they complement that is by saying hospitals are filling up, reports Alexis Madrigal, and they are running out of staff. They need to take care of patients. So the format that the writer in this particular case used is they use the headline of the, the title of this article as their hook, and then they built up to it with um, a little bit more information in the caption. All right, we can see the next one. You can also pull an interesting quote. And what I tell most people when they're writing captions for social media that use quotes, you wanna make sure that it is in it when, when you're using it for the right reason. So you shouldn't just pull some random quote. It should be something that is gonna be included in what the audience is gonna be reading furthermore or what they are gonna be experiencing. Whatever you're offering to the reader, that's when you can pull a quote from it. Otherwise, you will lose interest. They will lose interest um, when they're reading and they're gonna be like, eh, another quote, I'll move on. So in this case, uh, TED Talks was trying to promote some of their articles and they're talking about, for example, the challenges to those in power, use stories as a weapon, right? And what they wanted to do to draw more attention to it is pull a quote from that informational article to show a little bit of what the reader can find if only they click on the link. So it's a little bit of that reeling them in with a little bit of the information that they can find below. We use the example of uh, perinatal he hepatitis before. So let's say that it was an article in which a physician that was interviewed says a very powerful quote talking about this could save, I don't know, uh, insert number here, <laughs> children from being born with hepatitis. You might want to use that to grab the attention of the, of the reader in your caption and pull them on to reading the rest of the article. All right, we can go on to the next one. Okay, now sharing a digestible list. This is actually one of my favorite ways of writing captions. People, when they read in social media, they skim. <laughs> That is the most important thing to keep in mind. It happens a lot in blog writing. Um, you know that people are gonna be skimming the headlines to see what section actually speaks to what they're looking for. So if you make it easier for them to understand it by breaking a lot of information down in visually attractive lists, it, that's gonna perform a lot better. So yes, someone is mentioning that they love using emojis for bullet lists, same here. That is one of my team's favorite ways to do lists. We use the green check mark box. We use, um, in this case, they're using turkeys for Thanksgiving content. We've used turkeys before. We've used the autumn leaves emoji. So it really is contextual. You want to keep all those things in mind, but just making it so much easier for your reader to kind of like skim and be like, oh, here's a list. Okay, they're saying to do this, 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 and that. Perfect. I love it. Let me click on the link and kind of get the rest of the information that I need. All right, next one. And now using relevant emojis. So we mentioned the, the turkeys and how you know you want to make sure that you're using the right context when you're picking your emojis. But one of the things that a lot of people forget is that emojis, of course, they are a form of communication, right? But a lot of them kind of signify action. So if you have a swipe left to learn more, you can always use an emoji pointing to the direction. If you have a Find the link in bio, you can always use emoji pointing down to draw attention to it. Um, one of the most like funny things that people are talking about lately about Insta stories or just sharing locations in general is that the old location mentioned tag is out. And right now the most famous way or the most popular way to showcase your location is by using the, the pin emoji and then writing down the name of where you're at. There's a lot of concerns about driving away from finding the actual location, but you can always just hide the geotag and use that as a reference. You can use it in your you can use it in your captions, you can use it um, in your headers. It's definitely a great way to attract attention, and it's something that is recognizable and easy to digest. Um, again, the camera emoji is definitely the way, the universally accepted way in social media to give credit to photographers. That's also very important. Give credit whenever you're utilizing um, 
creative materials or words from other people. The internet never forgets. We all know this. And we definitely don't want to commit a faux pas of, you know, just unintentionally stealing a piece of intellectual property. And so definitely adding those little emojis to, to give credit where credit is due is very important. The folded hands emoji, and I don't know, I, I was looking at the presentation before, and we definitely were able to see the emojis here, but for some reason, Zoom is not having it. So the folded hands emoji is, is this one. <laughs> it's actually, I didn't know this, it's a prayer emoji, but um, in the internet, it's commonly recognized as a thank you, as a, um, as a please. So it's definitely a very dynamic emoji that you can use beyond the context of what the emoji itself means. And lastly, the hard eyes emoji is typically used to express excitement or joy. Thank you, Mackenzie, for the examples. Personally, I love the hard eye emoji, but if I want to seem a little bit less attached to um, the response, I use the star eye emoji, which um, to me and my team, it usually represents a little bit more of like that excitement, like, yay, you rock. Great, this is amazing, you look amazing. Um, without it being like, we are obsessed with you. <laughs> Which can happen, you know, in social media. Sometimes you have those common commenters and you, you wanna keep that relationship a little aloof. <laughs> All right, on to the next slide. Okay, so we have reached the point of another activity. So the, the ask is to produce one social media post for the article below. And I'm gonna go over the article real quickly as you start working on it. But for Transgender Awareness Month this November and PIN News is highlighting the Trevor Project and ways to support the transgender youth. The Trevor Project is a nonprofit organization focused on creating loving and welcoming world for the LGBTQ plus community or youth specifically, focusing on areas like crisis support, advocacy, research and education. Um, this organization is the world's largest suicide prevention and mental health organization in, for this community. So from the from resources and guides to like this one, understanding gender identities, it's underlined, so it would have been a link, I'm guessing, to a 24-7 crisis line and virtual community. The Trevor Project provides several resources to support mental health and prevent suicide amongst LGBTQ plus young people. So what would be um, a caption that you would write, you know, highlighting the, the, the Trevor Project or maybe an article about the Trevor Project that, that you could write um, and remember all of the ways that you can draw attention to it, you can do it by supporting uh, with the first line of your caption, you can support your headline, you can use a list, make use of those emojis, those are always important and, and don't be afraid to use them. Of course, you can stay within a safety net of approved emojis, but don't be afraid of them. And yeah, you can also use um, some of the, the headers or CTAs that, that we discussed in the earlier portion of this of this webinar. All right, let's see. We'll give you a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's a little bit more complex. <clears throat> All right, anyone has any any ideas that you would like to share with the rest of us? All right, we have one. Um, learn how you can become an ally for hashtag transgender and hashtag non-binary youth. Check out at Trevor Project and at and then insert link here. That's yeah, a good one. It's a great one. It's, it's a great way to say it concisely. Um, and your call to action is included in there. So that's definitely 
a good way to write in. Our next one, November is Transgender Awareness Month. The Trevor Project provides support, mental health, and prevent suicide among LGBTQ plus young people. Find out how you can support by visiting, insert link here, hashtag Transgender Awareness Month, hashtag Trevor Project, hashtag mental health, and hashtag prevent suicide. Yes, hashtags. <laughs> Love to see the hashtags. All right, we can see one more example. We can move on to our next <laughs> slide after. All right, for our final one, November is Transgender Awareness Month and NPIN is highlighting hashtag the Trevor Project. Click the link below to learn how you how to better support transgender youth in your community, hashtag mental health. Really, really well, I, I really like it. Um, personally, what I would have done, it's probably use the ad for the Trevor, the Trevor Project just to make sure that we also get the visibility from their followers. But other than that, it's an excellent, um, an excellent example of how, how we can synthesize all that they're saying into a caption. All right, so yeah, we can move on to our next. All right, so all of that, that was just the first part. <laughs> We're moving on to applying storytelling. So go ahead and let's move on to the next one. All right, so here's some methods of how to apply storytelling on social media. Now, storytelling, it's perhaps one of the most important aspects of creating social media content, whether that's written, video, an image, whether we like it or not, people are in social media to be entertained first and foremost, and then informed. So definitely um, storytelling is one of the best ways that we can do that, that we can engage our audiences. And some of the methods that you can use in your content to use storytelling, especially when writing, is to one, answer key questions, um, two, contextualize com compelling photographs or imagery, celebrate or recognize a person and activate nostalgia. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so uh, answering key questions. One of the main things that we need to keep in mind when writing captions or writing copy for social media is that the reader, the reader will understand what they get, what they see. If they only get an image, we need to provide context for that image, right? If they get um, a video, but it's just 30 seconds of you know, a list, we still need to provide a little bit of context for them to kind of grasp the whole um, meaning of that post. So an example that we utilize is here by the TSA. They, it's a really funny caption because they're using a lot of wordplay, but um, they start with, must ask you a question that we cannot shape for later. Do you have your real ID yet? It's very important, LOL, right? But the important part here is when they go on to explain how beginning October 1st, 2021, all travelers 18 and above will need a real ID, compliant driver's license, state issued enhanced driver's license or another acceptable form of ID to fly within the United States. So yes, they're talking about a very serious topic. They're utilizing um, a little bit of fun play to capture their audience, making it a hook, but the important information is still there. The context is still there. All right, we can move on to the next one. And now, speaking of context, contextualizing compelling photographs or imagery. Something that is very powerful to utilize in social media is, of course, photograph or um, video, right? Photography or video are great tools. They are the visual communicator aspect of these social communities, digital communities, I mean. So when we provide an image that uh, it is powerful in and of its own. There still needs to be a little bit of context. Giving here the examples by the NPR, um, personally really like the example of the photograph on the right, which is Amina who has suffered forced marriage and captivity at the hands of Boko Haram from the age of 13, now lives in a safe house in Northeastern Nigeria, where she says there's peace and security. 
So what they're saying is they're using this image to reel you in. They're using a very good composition in the image um, and all of the hidden psychology of images and video that we can possibly use when we're creating content, but we're also giving that humanity angle that we're grounding this image in reality by giving a little bit of that background. And that is what storytelling really means, right? If we were to just provide an image and say, well, um, here's an image of a, of a person just standing in front of it and smiling, we, we wouldn't be able to tell what we wanna communicate there, right? So if we give the context that this person is happy because they're finally uh, feeling a sense of safety and security because they got vaccinated or something, that is when we start building that story that we can continue to create with the rest of the copy we create. Next slide, please. All right, celebrate or recognize a person. Uh, for this particular style of content, I love to reference the Humans of New York account, which we all know and love. And we recognize that this style of social media content came from this account. And um, it's the, the format of utilizing just one image and then telling the story of the person in the caption. Starbucks is using it here. Um, to humanize their either employees, the, the people that you that are their customers. So definitely it is a great option for when you want to add that human touch to a brand, particularly if you're trying to humanize a niche, an issue that can feel a little bit distant for your audience. They can be like, well, why should I care about this? This doesn't affect me. Telling the stories of people who have actually lived through whatever you're trying to bring to light, it's a, it's a great way to, to build that story and to engage your audience. Next slide, please. All right, the next is gonna to be to activate nostalgia. The internet thrives with nostalgia. We, we love it. We eat it up every time. We talk about the early 2000s and anyone's gonna be like, oh my God, I lived through that. Um, so how do we use that when we are trying to communicate a little bit more complex issues or if you want to engage our audience with something a little bit more lighthearted? So for example, here, the Department of Interior used this image of Joshua Tree National Park in California. And they say, like, if you've had the chance to take in the sunset at Joshua Tree in California, you've experienced the otherworldly feeling of the park that the park evokes. And they talk about the spiky, twisted branches reaching for the sky and the, the colors of the, the sky and everything. So what they're doing is more than just activated nostalgia, they, they use the activation of nostalgia when they say, if you've been here, right, you, you will remember this. But they're also using a lot of imagery and descriptive wording to transport the reader to the location without even having to leave their homes, right? We, they talk about all of this very descriptive wording about the, the spiky twisted branches, the air of an arabesque extension, just beautiful silhouette. It's flowery language that it's meant to transport you there. So I think that it's a, a beautiful example of how you can utilize that memory component of the reader to, to engage with your post. Next slide, please. All right, <clears throat> another activity. So um, use some of the information below to draft an engaging Twitter post. Great news, it's a Twitter post, so it's meant to be small, short, <laughs> short and sweet. You can pick any of the fully pointed information below and we'll give you a couple of minutes um, for you to draft something up. Don't overthink it. That's what I love to tell my team when we are writing. At the beginning, you know, all drafts are first drafts and then we start working it together and we're chopping it. So don't be afraid to let that creativity run free.
And just to clarify a little, I know the headline can be a little deceiving that it says this post is half full. It means that it just, you know, it needs a little bit of reworking. So um, it's not about finishing the, the post, but rather reworking this information into a tweet. Providing a little bit of context. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our first response. Do your students need quality education? Check out the most recent version of the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool, HECAT, by the CDC with updated designs to help students develop health knowledge. Hashtag health education, hashtag mental and emotional health. Good one, Camille. Looks like we might have stumped everyone with this one. <laughs> that is okay. If anyone finishes theirs um, after we continue with the presentation, it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look in the comments. Definitely. All right, let's move on. Okay, so we are moving on to the last portion of the creating and writing style part of, of this. Um, and that's going to be playing to a platform strength. So yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. All right. So why does playing with the platforms to a platform strength matter? Because there is a lot of differences between one platform and the other. So we can't just write one caption and expect it to work for all of all of the platforms. You have character limits in some. You have um, different needs in others. It really depends on the asset or the piece of content that you're going to publish and the platform itself. Um, how to accomplish this, you can execute to the product strength for a strong user experience and offer the same information using distant editorial styles. And then, as you can see on the right, we have a little bit of the universally understood tone of each platform. So for Twitter, we know that it tends to be a little bit, obviously more concise, data-driven, newsy. It has a very like flash information tone to it. So it might be something that will change the caption that you were working with. Um, Facebook tends to be friendly and neighborly, except when people are renting, but you know, it's more of a, an exception to the rule. Um, Instagram is fun and narrative and LinkedIn tends to be a little bit more professional. All right, next slide, please. All right, so when we are executing to the product strengths for you for the for a stronger user experience, my bad. So we're talking about how can we use the main purpose of the platform for your benefit. For example, here the New York Times is presenting the same piece that they are trying to promote with two different captions to target different audiences based on the platform they are using. So on Facebook, the, the platform says Quibi, the short form streaming service that drew big names like Steven Spielberg and Antoine Fuqua is shutting down just six months after it launched. So it, it's a concise description, but then um, they have a direct link underneath. And in LinkedIn, it talks a little bit more, uh, it, it expands a little bit more about it because it is trying to attract an audience that would be knowledgeable on that field already. So there isn't a lot of concise or content that you have to provide in as many, as little words as possible. They, they're assuming that their audience would be already knowledgeable. All right, next slide. Okay, so in this case, um, we're talking about same information, but different ways to present it. 
So we have the TSA um, in Twitter and then on Instagram. So for Twitter, obviously they have a caption, um, a character limit has been extended, but you know, it, it is a, it plays to your advantage to keep it as short as possible. So they're using different images, but they are still celebrating or observing National Avocado Day, right? As you can see, the Twitter caption is much shorter while the Instagram caption shows a lot more of um, information. It talks about fruits and vegetables, that they are ripe to go through security, um, what you would need in order for it to be compliant to go through TSA and that kind of more context and information that can be used in that platform. Next slide, Sakia. All right, actually, well, can we go just back to the last one so that I can use it as, as the background to something I wanted to add? Thank you. Um, so just a little piece of advice that I like to remind people about is SEO and how social media platforms have become a search engine for a lot of people. So when we're talking about platforms, especially like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, not as much. Facebook is more about interacting what's already on your feed. But when we are dealing with um, Twitter, Instagram, even I'm going to say the TikTok word, um, the users are looking at times for something specific. So they might be, they might be uh, trying to find information on a specific subject and topic. So make sure that you are including those keywords that are going to be important for them to find your content, whether that is um, the copy that is on the image or the first lines of your caption on, on your video, if, the, if there's a voiceover, that those words are being utilized. Because at the end of the day, hashtags are still a relevant part of social media content writing, but they tend to fall to the bottom compared to this in-content copy that is being utilized. So just keep that in mind when you are creating content in your writing and make sure that you are utilizing words that are going to help you attract the reader you're looking for. And it's going to help the reader find your, your assets as well. All right, we can move on to the last slide or the next slide. <laughs> All right, so just lastly, relate and revise. So this is all about write, think, follow, and review. Um, make sure that you write one post first and then adjust it for each platform. I like to call it, you write the main, um, the main caption or the main asset. You think about where your audience is the most. Write that first, worry about that first, and then you can adjust for other platforms. Um, think of the people you know who use these platforms when you're drafting copy. As always, try to be, um, to utilize inclusive language when available and necessary, um, and make sure that you are being you know open and respectful in your communication online again the internet never forgets that is a social media's mantra manager's mantra um because at the end of the day anything that it goes up there can be screenshotted and reshared and it can become a bigger thing so try to be as inclusive and and respectful as possible uh, follow your favorite health communication peers and competitors on all platforms i love this piece of advice it's always very important to know what your competitor or collaborators, I like to think of them, they can be your future collaborators, you never know, um, are doing online. They are your biggest inspiration and also they set the standard that you are aspiring to and that you kind of like overdo them uh, on it. So make sure what they're doing so that you can do better. <laughs> and lastly, review, um, review your drafts. Always ask for a second or a third pair of eyes uh, to look over things. Sometimes it can be really easy to slip up and forget to add a letter or just, you know, something can sound a little bit off. And specifically in Twitter, people can be a little bit aggressive about how they correct, um, especially public, like uh, official accounts. So definitely just make sure that you have as much support with the review and that you can get a second or third pair of eyes in there. All right, and I believe that concludes our active presentation part. All right, so we'll open the floor for a minute or two for any other lingering questions. Um, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand.
I know we've also kind of been like answering questions as we've gone along. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Yes, the slides will be made available. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> we really appreciate um, your attention for the past hour. Any question, please feel free to reach out, okay? Everyone have a great joining day. Joining us, everyone.